Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. We've reached episode 647. It's being recorded on October 6, 2021. It's a Wednesday. I'm Sebastian Peake. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walworth. I'm Brett Van Spromberg. And you can find out when we go live by signing up for our mailing list. I don't think I got an email, Brett. Maybe. I think you might be lying about that. Okay. I mean, I checked earlier. He hit the go button. You can support us by going to patreon.com slash PC per uh, any news on the Patreon front, Brett, or just, uh, it's a, uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a status quo week this week, okay. which are important weeks. Yeah. Uh, simply because, uh, we didn't have a mass exodus of supporters, which means that there is a reasonable number of people out there who tolerate and enjoy this sort of thing. And if you're one of those people, please hop onto the Patreon. Patreon.com slash PC per think about throwing a couple of bucks into the kitty. Keep this party going. Appreciate it very much. Indeed. And we've reached already a minute in clearly the most important, uh, segment of the show. No, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. hmm. but I, I don't know what you think you're doing, Josh, this. It's a twist. Okay. I'll just let Josh take this. Laramie, Wyoming. So anyway, <clears throat> every once in a while, you've just got to, you've got to shake things up a bit. And I'm, I'm going to turn 50 next year. You wouldn't think it by the way I act, but it's the truth. And this week, I just, just didn't feel like a burger. I think the back pain and, and how poorly I handled it just made me kind of rethink some of my priorities. And so I, I saw some of those Huel advertisements, H-U-E-L, about the hot and savory packs. And I figured I'd give them a shot. And so I, I got the uh, spicy Thai green curry, the tomato savory soup, hearty tomato, something like that, and then the uh, Mexican chili. And so uh, today I, I came home for lunch and I whipped up a batch of the Huel Mexican chili and added some sriracha, and I ate it. And it was surprisingly good. The green Thai is okay. The hearty tomato is a little bit better, but out of the three, I probably like this one the best. It actually tasted like a pretty decent uh, chili. And it had some spice to it, which, you know, for general consumers, that's that's not something they often do. And apparently this is quite healthy. It's a lot of quinoa, quino? How do you pronounce that? Quinoa. Otherwise quinoa? <laughs> yeah, man, rice and, you know, tomatoes and all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, I had to, I had to put some sriracha in there. Shake well, it was. So that was that was my lunch. I, I didn't have a burger. This doesn't mean that I will be giving up burgers, but I I just yeah, I've been I've been getting a, you know a bowl of this stuff a day and, and let me tell you the fiber is good for you. And uh it's pretty filling, happily. And you know, it's it's full, I guess, of, of a lot of things you need and I probably have been missing in my diet. So yeah. I don't know if you want to do something yourselves and go to that online food store thing. But apparently there's about seven meals in each package, and it comes out to be $3 a bowl. Hmm. And uh, if you consider going to McDonald's and getting uh, a Big Mac meal, it's it's probably 7 bucks right there. So, Oh, yeah, for sure. After tax? Yeah, after food, food, food is getting... Food is getting extremely expensive, and I think it's going to get worse in the next couple of months. But so that's just my opinion. Josh, in a surprising oh, move, right. has a sensible lunch. Jeremy, on the other hand, has the lunch of champions. Is he saving the segment? Oh, that was dinner. Oh, okay. That was that was As just moments before this podcast. Moments let ago. Me ro- let me roll right, that take back. It away, Jeremy. Jer- Jeremy has the dinner of champions. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, Smirnoff 100 is highly recommended as a digestif just for a free pour as you're eating. It's perfect. But yeah, no, I, I've sort of felt a little bit 
jealous of Josh's uh, wonderful chili and thought that, you know, I should, you know, make something maybe he could feel jealous of too. So uh, it's my old homemade burger that because I hate gout more than I love pure beef is two thirds beef and one third chicken, but uh, grilled up nicely on a, a peasant bun with some hand cut Polsky old uh, a French goat cheese and some aged gouda on the top with a little bit of Guinness barbecue sauce and air fried fries, which as you can see, actually do work once you figure out how to do them right. Fresh spinach and uh, tomatoes just to make it officially two veg and away you go. That's a good looking burger, Jeremy. It Thank is. You. I'm actually hungry. I'm There's hungry some, right now. The problem and is I, I hear the chicken yeah. to yeah. it changes the texture and it changes the way it cooks and it's kind of annoying, but I also like the plump burgers i'm not into the flattened into absolute nothing and then two of them added because that is probably a significant amount of beef yeah I didn't sometimes measure it, but you know, it's every once in a while i like to go get the freddy's steak burger and they they really flatten those things out but they do it in a way that's really tasty it's a different type of a, thing yeah we've got a few that chains that do that sort of things so we've got uh was it five guys i think that does that so yeah, there's a few that do it, and if I'm in that sort of a mood, yeah, because you get all a lot more crispy bits and crunchy yeah. stuff going. But if I want a real burger, I want thick, nice, juicy. Jeremy did the burger equivalent uh, in our segment here of a fading three pointer. So okay, all right, excellent job. Nice work. Who's tasty? <laughs> it's not like I suffered for this. Yeah, and I hate gout too. Every once in a while, I come down with it as well. It sucks. Yep. Hence, another reason for eating yep. the gruel. <laughs> when I'm even having a root beer tonight instead of regular oh beer. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Josh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink in your stead. And Gordon at PC World has been a little critical of Windows 11, which endears him to me greatly. But he wrote a story about how Windows 11, which, of course, came out yesterday... October 5, even though it was really out a day early. Windows 11 might tank Ryzen CPU performance AMD warns. So, Ouch. quite a big uh, performance hit because of uh, L3 cache latency, I believe. It might be core scheduling. It's both. Yeah. And it's a support note from AMD. This is not just like the community complaining. It's No, it's AMD saying, oh, it... it don't upgrade to Windows 11 yet. If you're on Ryzen, like, you know, most enthusiasts are. Did you see my tweet today where I linked directly to AMD's page that details? Yep. Yes. I should probably click on that link. <laughs> the actual uh, <laughs> AMD known performance changes. Measured and functional L3 cache latency may increase by approximately 3x. And preferred core may not preferentially schedule threads on a processor's fastest core. Oh, uh, that's fine. Don't worry. A Windows update is in and development. And you'll definitely notice it on processors with more than a 65 watt TDP and 8 cores. <laughs> okay, do you think... Let's just, let's just put on our tinfoil hats here for a second. Microsoft and Intel... Are He's not that competent. Right Microsoft and Intel are working very closely right now on this advertising campaign to bash Apple because, of course, Apple, who used to be partnered with Intel, now has their own silicon, so now they're the bad guys. It just, it just feels like right now there's this tight bond between Intel and Microsoft and AMD processors being totally unoptimized for with the new version of Windows 11 after all this time seems a little... So. It's it's so strange that there's a thing called Wintel out mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, a concept. So yeah, but uh, someone really dropped the ball um, at Microsoft and maybe even at AMD because how long have they had builds of this? I don't know. It's yeah. bizarre. I don't see Microsoft being competent enough to actually manage to program something that works better on one architecture than the other and i mean as my example will be intel management engine which continually screws up uh dell machines and a variety of other ones so that they never actually shut down they only go into a very deep sleep 
And once again, that has come back. So, I mean, it's, it's not like Microsoft doesn't mess up the Intel things as well. But then there's the, also the other point, which is that Windows 11 and Intel killer NICs don't work very well right now. Also hmm. a huge slowdown. <laughs> what's, what's the problem? <laughs> I, I mean, not for anyone who's paid extra for a, a high uh, speed NIC, right? And the smart bite, which I haven't really dealt with much. Uh, and I mean, if you're an Oracle user, yeah. And you're running an AMD virtual machine using a killer NIC. Well, you're just, just totally just screwed. You just windows 11 just killed you. Well, this is fun. Yeah. It's, it's a new release. What do you expect? Mm-hmm. Uh, and unfortunately true. What do, what do I expect? I would expect something that's been tested to work on common hardware. Well, Sebastian, how much time did you spend testing for them? Zero hours, but that's you your know, fault. I, I feel entitled. You, you, you are yeah. now their beta tester. They're getting <laughs> Wasn't it like data five years ago that they canned a large portion of their Q and a people. Yes. Was yeah. it like about the same time as the, uh, he was, he was part of that, and he got laid off, as well as a bunch of others. And Yeah. That was also when they started pushing, like, the insider rings for the Windows preview builds and turning it all into sort of a game where you were supposed to just volunteer your time. And if you did a lot of testing, you got access to newer versions of it. And you're supposed to provide feedback, just almost like it was a paid job, which they suddenly realized they could outsource to people who, like, get point internet points. It's just, it feels quite arrogant to say, look, we're 90 plus percent of the market, no matter what we do. If we don't test this stuff, if we do test this stuff, it doesn't matter. We just print money. So we don't care. They don't have to care. There's no competition. There's the Linux world, which is vast, but unfortunately, it's a tiny percentage of the overall market and Microsoft knows it. And even though it's a lot friendlier... I mean, Linux than it used to be. It's still, it's still, I mean, you got to know what you're doing. If you want to do things like, you know, play games. I mean, if you're just going to browse and watch movies and stuff, sure. That's easy, easy productivity things, you know, run genome as your desktop environment or, or KMZ. I can't remember all the different ones. Uh, yeah. K- K- I mean, that's, K-D-E. that's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. KDE. Yeah. Um, kids yeah i mean that stuff is easy to do but yeah once you start getting into gaming then you're dealing with making sure the drivers work with all the different software that yeah it's just it's it's i don't know john yeah, Proton, steam, deck. Yeah. steam deck steam deck steam deck is, that's true is, yeah that is steam your next gonna gaming help. pc Yep, is plowing the way. I mean, anti cheat from uh, who's who just did anti cheat on Linux? Who just got it working? Um, two companies just did. I'm trying to remember who they were. But anyway, yeah, it's uh, becoming a legit platform. But you're right, it's almost there. It's not quite. It's coming. becoming a legit platform. Brett Van Spear, 2021. Yeah. Well, for Ooh, gaming. The platform yeah. that runs for gaming. the internet that runs... Okay. Right, oh, there. come on. For gaming. All right, all right. Mere, of course, I work, Linux, I work in Linux all day. Proton. Proton makes things much easier. Twitch was hacked. And it wasn't just hacked, apparently. Everything was hacked. Every bit of it. The source code. All the user data. It's just creator earnings. Earnings, the one that's earnings history. Yeah. Yep. yeah, you're we right. We can find out how much Josh made off of uh, playing Battleships. Wow. Uh, I made nothing. Josh, <laughs> I, I was going to suggest... Figured. Maybe you should start using Twitch. I mean, it looks like, uh, you know, there's money to be made over there. I mean, you could probably make yeah. a million. Yeah. Oh, easy. And, and they that- have acknowledged it. Look, here's their tweet. <clears throat> we can confirm a breach has taken place. And they are but working on it. The, the, the one above like that a- is my favorite, though. What? What's that? So one? they're talking about how Twitch's community is a horrible, disgusting, toxic cesspool. <laughs> they posted on 4chan. <laughs> they literally a, posted that on 4chan. There's a certain oh. lack of awareness in that, I think. Yeah, I, you have a point there. 
There's uh, there's like two things that I want to mention about this. One, it was even went beyond Twitch to a couple of related uh, properties that they own. But the second thing is there's a lot of people drawing parallels with this into into like an AWS problem because Twitch in 2014 or so was actually bought by Amazon for almost a billion dollars or something, $970 million. Yeah, I remember that. Or, yeah, it was very expensive. Anyway, so yeah, Amazon owns it. This is not an AWS problem. AWS has a, uh, a very um, shared responsibility model, which is that they are responsible for the security of the, of the cloud and you say Twitch, when they move their application into an AWS environment are responsible for their security in the cloud. So this was not a breach of an AWS problem. Definitely not. This is a breach of Twitch. And it, to me, it smells like an inside job, the way that this sort of rolled out with the yeah. deep, deep accessibility into all of the Git repositories. And they knew just what to get across the entire spectrum. They knew where to go. They extracted it very neatly. And probably walked out with a, I'll just guess, you know, they probably walked out with some a of which USB were really stick. cool backups. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Well, 125 yeah, gigs. Nice. So maybe like a 128 gig thumb drive. Uh, you know, it would, could fit, it would it. fit. It would fit. Yeah. Well, no, a I little NVMe drive, so it's faster. True. Pick but well, see, the 100, 125 gig XFIL over, you know, outbound bandwidth. I mean, even them as a big company probably has it, but who wants to risk, you know, spiking the um the monitors on on long transfers inside of a company it's probably was a walkout that's my guess i think so yeah yeah because this is something and we're going to mention just briefly in passing some console stuff later but i've i've been thinking for a while after i heard about this because if you don't remember samsung has a joint venture with amd to bring rdna2 graphics to a mobile platform it's a new exynos soc it has these rdna2 graphics they are announcing that this features ray tracing, which makes sense. RDNA 2 obviously supports ray tracing. And they posted it to social media so that the compression algorithm got to it pretty good. Exactly. It's like so uh, yeah. similar looking pictures <laughs> that are just still. Yeah, exactly. Compare these pictures, which is completely useless once they post But them if you look at the underside of the tank, there are reflections of the flames. And on this one, there are not. Yeah, so but I that could see, be brightness like, and gamma, maybe. And there's you these know. Uh, these effects, the fire okay, on the building. Yeah. Oh, that's the okay, same. there you, you've got a point okay. there. Yep. Uh, All right. What else is different? It looks like they're using more contrast in the other image. Oh, wait, look. There are flames in this car, and here <gasps> there's no car at all. The power Ooh. of ray tracing to <laughs> bring in that's a... <laughs> models that just aren't there without it. I don't, I don't think that's how that works. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Have you not played the Quake remake? You turn it on and there's all sorts of stuff that wasn't there before. <laughs> so let's see. The rumor, the rumors claim there's an AMD RDNA 2 GPU codenamed Voyager or V'ger when we finally find it, uh, you know, centuries later. You made a movie reference. Nice. Yeah. We'll feature 384 yeah. stream processors. So that would be six ray accelerators. Anyway. Some speculation here. It's nice to know that ray tracing in some form, or at least support for some features of ray tracing, will be available on a mobile platform. This is exactly what Nintendo needed for the uh, 4K Switch if they were ever going to do that. Think about it. Yeah, well. Jeremy, can you please try to make sense of, first of all, how to pronounce this, and second, what it is? It's an Intel product. I can read that. Yeah, that much. It's It fits on a yep. fingertip. Yes, because, well, I mean, how big do you want your neuromorphic compute, cu- uh, neuromorphic compute tile to be? That might be named Loi? So this is Intel taking a completely different approach into high-performance computing. And because they're modeling it off of a brain up to the point of referring to some things as axons and dendrites, it's not easy to explain in any way, shape, or form, but I will attempt to. Uh, Essentially, instead of trying to explain what all it is, because Ars Technica did a a fairly good job on that, and Serve the Home also put up a a good definition of what the specs are inside of it, although we still don't know what Intel 4 processing node really is, other than Intel 4. Uh, 
So they're trying to get away from the major issue that you have with quantum computing and our traditional neural nets, where with quantum, you've literally got to build it specifically with the, the qubits entangled to solve a specific problem. It's, it's not a general processing computer. It, it's built to figure out a specific thing. With neural nets, you have the same sort of thing. You have to train it to be able to recognize parrot and you run into issues where you know the parrot is partially concealed or it's actually a cantaloupe with the word parrot written on it and it's yeah no i am 100 percent well 98 percent sure that that thing is a bloody parrot and there's nothing you're going to be able to do to convince me it's not unless you retrain me from scratch so what intel is trying to do is make something that's a lot more plastic that uh is given a general task and some general training, but they're only going for good enough performance. They're, they're not looking for perfect efficiency or anything. They're just looking at, yeah, okay, there's a drone that's running this, and yeah, it bounced off three or four of the obstacles, but it made it. Uh, whereas if a, you've got a, a one that's been trained by a neural net and one of those uh, obstacles looks slightly different than it was trained on, it may ignore it, it may panic, you, you're not going to know really what it does, and if it, whatever it does, if you don't like it, you're going to have to train it again from bloody scratch. Uh, one of the examples Ars Technica used, which seems relatively useful uh, in the short term, is a robot. Uh, so you've got a, a robot working in a car factory or whatever, and over time, its performance is going to change. Uh, things are going to start to erode. Uh, the, the pressure on the hydraulics aren't going to be the same. So if you've got a neural net trained, it knows exactly how it's supposed to do everything. And as changes happen in the systems, you're going to end up with inaccuracies at the end product because their own net is not capable of dealing with those changes. With Intel's LOI, or LOI, or however you want to pronounce it, They've actually set it up in a way that it should be able to handle small changes and actually be able to find new local uh, efficiency maximums. So it's a very small, it's a very small sample size. There hasn't really been much on it other than the PR and try, trying to explain exactly how it does it and how the architecture is going to be a little bit less uh, power hungry is incredibly difficult quickly, but it's certainly something that's interesting. Did you get anything else out of it, Josh? Not too much. They didn't go into a whole lot of details. Um, trying to mimic the, the brain is an interesting way just because, you know, neurons actually grow and split off and yeah, new dendrites and, making new connections. So I, I'd be curious, uh, you know, how, how they are representing that in, in, you know, non movable silicon. And is it, is it yeah. more FPGA and in, in what they're doing? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, oh. it'll be interesting to find out. Oh, they also talked about 3d stacking it as well, uh, hmm. which could lead to some interesting interconnects. And then they don't really talk about the interconnects at all, which is another, yeah. I mean, it looks neat, but we, damn it, we need more info. WCCF Tech is where I saw this. I know there's a bunch of reviews out there for the OLED switch, which came out in the last couple of days, but there was a teardown that confirmed HDMI 2.0 present in the dock. So it's, and a 4K HDR ready HDMI cable, apparently. So the system itself is essentially the same, it has a couple of minor tweaks, and it has an OLED panel with a smaller bezel, so it's a slightly bigger screen. But the interesting thing is there were all these rumors about there was going to be this new SOC, it was going to be more powerful, it was going to support ray tracing and DLSS, oh. which of course indicated it was going to be an NVIDIA product, and it was going to have 4K output. It was going to be upscaled, but still, there's a video out there, which is linked in the WCCF Tech article, that shows that the dock itself can output 4K. So it, it looks like they were probably working on something and it got canceled. I'm thinking probably like chip shortage related. Who knows? Maybe it was um, power or thermal issues with putting a beefier chip in the small handheld that could do 4K and ray tracing. But anyway. I, I bet that was it. I bet it was heat dissipation over the long term. Like they couldn't do it. My like it wouldn't you know, work. But... Me. 
Yay. It's actively cooled already, but I mean, they mm. can spin up and get pretty loud sometimes mm-hmm. without outputting above 720p and without doing ray tracing. So, right. So imagine. And then another console note, this is on the Sony side of things. There was a bunch of news a few months ago about the PlayStation 4 basically becoming a brick if you um, replace the CMOS battery. Because yeah. then you'd have to go to like the, the servers to have the system reactivate. They've pushed out firmware rather belatedly that eliminates this. So you can switch out the CMOS battery later on and not have a system that's just unable to do anything. It's version 9.00 of the software if you have the PS4. So no PS3 update. And then I just nope. heard uh, yesterday that the PS3 and Vita are soon pretty much, not officially, but they're sort of unofficially shutting down the stores because they're turning off PayPal and credit card payments. So you have to get, you have to buy a gift card or buy digital gift cards and then put in the code and then redeem the code or you can't buy anything. Acer, Predator, you've heard of it. There, it could mean anything. That's just their but not in this context. Brand. But it doesn't. Acer yeah, it's Predator. not just anything. Yeah, it's a NVMe drive with what looks like a thick heat spreader on it. What is this? It, it's not quite a heat sink. No, it's, that's a heat thick heat spreader. Inno Everything comes with them. I G. Yeah. 5236 is a 4x4 NVMe 1.4 controller. Tell me more. Okay, I guess I could. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, Jeremy first off, I thought you were going to say Faison <laughs> again. I can just pretend that I know what I'm talking about and read off of your <laughs> No, this here. is, uh, you know, it, it, it's been kind of boring that every single drive has been a Faison controller. So apart from, you know, how much RAM they've stuck on it and what the SLC cache looks like, it's the same bloody drive. So this is actually a brand new controller that we don't see very much of. And on this particular one was a two terabyte drive. So there was just over 680 gigs of SLC, which is more than most of us are going to be writing. Uh, the price is crept up from where we like to see it, but is honestly about where you'd like to see. That's under 20 cents anyways. 18 nice cents a gig? Unacceptable. Yeah, no. no, look at all the other stuff. Well, <laughs> And it is fully and completely uh, com- rated to work with the PlayStation 5 if you want to upgrade in- that instead of your PC. But Ooh. when they were... The testing was impressive. Like, it's pushing past the uh, WD Black SN50 new, the 980 Pro, and the MP600 Pro in a lot of tests not in every single one but in a lot of tests if it ain't the best it is damn close uh, i think that's one of the ones where it's yeah just off the t- the maximum it does of course you know if you do do a huge sustained write that uh, goes over the 608 gig worth of uh slc that you've got it does fall down but i mean that's what you expect from a, a tlc drive and honestly, if you're not doing a lot of stuff, if you're not writing hundreds and hundreds of gigs of data, the speed on this thing is really impressive. And it's, it's you know, pushing the, the FIs on stuff, uh, at least it's giving it a good competition, if not beating it. So overall, I mean, it's it's rather impressive. There you go. There's the sustained. So once you break about 600, it's down to about uh, two gigabits. And then after a while, you're down to, well... It's, it's TLC, so you know how fast it's okay. going to go. So it looks like about one gigabyte per second is what it will eventually fall to. If you were actually doing jobs where you're writing that much sustained. Mm-hmm. Because this is literally a fill the entire drive uh, test. So, yeah, if you were doing huge uh, photo editing that with, you know, 4K, 120 frame a second or something, yeah, maybe not the best thing to do. If you're a gamer, this thing is crazy fast and, you know, it's as long as you're finding it about the same price as everything else, then uh, it's it's definitely going to be recommended. And this is the first <laughs> product with the InnoGrit that we've seen? First one I've seen. Okay. Another player has emerged. Yay. I mean, it's okay. not as fast as the uh, SN850 and the uh, you know Fizon E18 with the really heavy duty um, no. NAND, 
which you know or or seven gigabyte per second um but yeah that's um that's that's reasonable price for a two terabyte pci 4.0 that goes above the 3.5 gigabyte you know that pci 3.0 has so so it's a nice compromise in between the really high-end stuff and the usual okay speaking of the usual uh, we've hmm. already talked about AI in this podcast. Let's talk about AI some more because people can't get enough. Oh god! Or, or no. maybe they can. No. Well, no, the no, AI can't. can't get enough. What is we're, Clearview we're, funny. AI? Uh, you remember a uh, year, year and a half ago, when a bunch of uh, U.S. police departments were sued for using this. Uh, AI capture of you know, several billion faces and then using them to search people's social history for everything that they uh, ever posted to the web or anyone anyone posted with them on the web to try and build up a uh, criminal profile of them so that they could go off and, uh, you know, arrest them because obviously they've had a history of something or other. And so that was Clearview AI. Uh, there was, you know, some... Serious feedback about it, uh, not least of which because uh, some of the people involved in it were absolutely freaking amazingly wonderful people um, who have, uh, you know, made the news in a lot of ways. Like, well, let's just say we're surprised that Martin Kelly was not one of them because it, it was that sort of crew uh, that ran the original one of this. So... Among other things, uh, they said to say, you know, hey, this Queerview AI is not definitely not allowing police to uh, put people in jail uh, based on shoddy background because they're 98% uh, percent accurate according to the tests that the ACLU do, does to for other stuff. And so they took the testing data Clearview provided and gave it to the ACLU who said... Yeah, that's not even freaking close to what we do. Uh, whatever the hell they're telling you, it's not using our process. And the accuracy is, you know, a bit better than flipping a coin sometimes, but generally not. So, yeah, there's been a lot of false arrests off of it. Well, uh, today, it turns out that, uh, one, Review AI is not backing off at all. Second, they also lied about how many images they've scraped. It's not just two or three billion, it's over 10 billion. And they've now designed an AI and app that'll go with it to allow customers, uh, before it cost a stupid amount of money because they didn't really have good search algorithms, but now they've got a nice little AI trained up. And so you can fire up an app and feed somebody's image in, and it will, in several seconds, come up with every single appearance of them on any picture from any social media that exists because it, they also got sued by Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for scraping these sites without permission. Uh, so boom, like literally your entire picture history on the internet will come up within seconds on a freaking smartphone app. So this definitely will not be misused or, you know, cause horrific uh, consequences in any way, shape or form. Of course not. I just feel sorry for them because they have to look at our pictures, which is, I think, why they will rise up and kill us so that we just stop taking pictures of those things. Look, as I just pointed out in Discord, I take great care to not post the pictures of myself on, on the Internet. Just putting that right out there. There's no pictures of me anywhere. Except for... You're, are you on social week. media at all? Except right? for the entire scrape of this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you put yourself out there for one to two hours every week on YouTube, but other okay, than that, you're using how many frames that is. Far Cry Six. Anybody excited about Far Cry Six? That's the latest big game to come out. I know Josh is. There's huh? some reviews out there. There's some information. I've heard. I think it was Cap Framex on Twitter who was talking about this is a CPU intensive game to a certain degree. Performance does not look bad. I was seeing. I think it was Brother in the Discord chat who was saying that. From one of the reviews, it might have been Tech Power Up. They were showing 1440p uh, highest detail settings, no ray tracing, and almost every card starting with a 1660 was giving you at least like 40, 50 frames per second. So it looks More like better. 
Yeah, so it, uh, like Far Cry 5, which is not a particularly demanding title, this is before you bring in the HD texture pack. Because this one, unlike the old HD texture pack in Far Cry 5, where it would still the memory footprint was still pretty small, this one apparently pushes about 11 gigs, so you can make an hmm. RTX 3080 fall down, where a 2080 Ti is okay. So here's one of the reviews. Uh, this is a Guru 3D... Talking about and this is stage. specifically the uh, DirectX 12 ray tracing. Oh, okay. So what are we looking at here? This is a 6700 so, And the other thing is that the, this is also one of the first you've got the uh, full support for FSR. So in this particular one, uh, I think they were doing on a 3080 uh, for this. So the red line is just the straight-out DX12 ray, ray tracing. So your jump went from about uh, 100 frames. There you go. There's okay. a, a good look at it. So across the board, you enable it. You're looking at about 20 frames dropping. But you notice the top cards on that ray tracing uh, benchmark? Mm-hmm. Well, it's almost uh, like the Far Cry people worked with AMD to optimize yeah. their game. For, <laughs> huh, how about that? But also yeah. DX12 uh, ray tracing is working pretty good. It's only once you get up into the 4Ks that uh, NVIDIA starts to get a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, makes sense. The 3090 is just a, a freaking beast for that sort of thing. But it, it's nice to see that, you know, at 4K with the new DX12 ray tracing on, you're still going to get decent performance on the video card you can't buy. <laughs> exactly. Well, where, where's, where's some old video cards? I guess they're not really any on here. Wait, what, what, there's something wrong down. Look tracing. at that. The RTX 3060 Ti? Uh, oh, well, it's because of, it's because of uh, memory space. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, the memory yep. on that would just go black. Blah. Yeah. The 3070 Ti, they have crashed... And so there's no result there, but yeah, you need more VRAM for these. But yeah, as soon as you put FSR on there, it actually runs. Huh. Because this was just ray tracing. They, they did FSR on the next one. So that's the nice thing I th like to saw, see about this is that you're looking at open source ray tracing and open source uh, resolution scaling. So it works on them both. Let's just look at some raster based results. This is um, 1440, ultra high quality. No ray tracing. Top of the list is still AMD, as you would expect from this title. So the 6900 XT is 107 frames per second average. 6800 XT is at a 103, which ties a 3080 Ti. And then if we go all the way to the bottom of the list... Okay, it does get down to about 30. If you go all the way back to an RX 470, <laughs> 30 frames per second. So that's kind of, the, I guess, the baseline. And that one you might actually be able to find. And let's see. Say you're still rocking a 580, 36 frames per second. Okay. I guess I guess Vega still runs really really nicely with Far Cry. They don't have them listed oh. here, but oh, here's a Vega uh, 64. Vega 64. Vega oh 64. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Getting over 60 frames per yeah, second. Look at so that, 61 yeah. frames. It, it's just higher than you'd expect. Yeah. Man, Vega was built for the future. <laughs> it was high bandwidth memory. TM. Okay. Well, those are our news stories this week. It's time to turn our attention to something we haven't had in a little while here at PC Per. A desk review. Everybody loves these, I'm assuming. Or maybe not. You know, what I if know. there's a video of them standing on it? I know. You know, you we're claim get to that in a you claim to have taken a ride up and down on this thing, but there's no footage to prove it. So I call BS on that. But look, here's the review. Flexi spot. Is it Kana? Kana? I, I, I called it the... In my head, I pronounced it Kana. Kana Pro? Tell us about yeah. it, Brett. This is a bambooed tabletop adjustable power dual motor standing desk. It arrived in multiple packages across different days, and it was heavy AF, I might say. The uh, motorized legs were 75 pounds alone. The desk weighed over 25 pounds. And it was only a 55 by 28 inch desk. Not all Where that large. Where does it large, list the it, product weight on here? I guess it shows loading you know, capacity, but okay. They don't list it in their specs, but uh -huh. I was impressed by the weight when it came <laughs> in. So I personally weighed it. And I'm like, this stuff is heavy. I think, 
you know, just to kind of impart a level of, of impartial quality, you know, cause stuff that weighs more might seem like it's of higher quality. There's a lot of steel in the, uh, in the support pieces and a lot of wood, solid wood in the bamboo top. Hmm. And I discovered something. I actually liked the bamboo top. Now I start off talking about some of the accessories here and some of the different ways you can order this. You can order it all the way up to a 78 by 30 inch desk, which is he pretty got. ginormous. I know. And you can get it with a, a a curved front so you can, you know, tuck your way right in there. But the next picture on this, which is a, uh, a snake essentially to route the cables from the floor to the desk in, in kind of a continuous stream, really remind me of uh, the Spider-Man Doc Ock look, you know, the Spider-Man arms. But it does neatly arrange all of the potentially different power and networking and and whatever cables you're running up from the floor down one stretchable or foldable uh, line. I've never seen a uh, spine or anything, you know, a, a snake like this. Thought that was sort of an interesting, interesting accessory. So that's kind of how it looks with their other accessories, their CPU um, or their uh, their case hanger that they've got going on there, and the uh, the curved front to the desk. But moving on with the actual unit that they sent me, uh, they sent me the pro version, which has got the oh uh, the way that this thing was packed, very impressive. Uh, the tabletop had super um, resilient corners so that, you know, wasn't going to get damaged in shipping. Uh, it was padded all the way around. Actually, I was really impressed. And they provide a, a neat way of making sure that they have a, an avenue to their customer service department so you can get uh, an issue taken care of right away. They seem really focused on that. Building it was easy. All uh, the hardware was neatly labeled. Um, they've got uh, pre-drilled holes in the bottom of the uh, of the bamboo there. Everything is adjustable, including the feet. <clears throat> and all the motors and stuff come together really well. Uh, 24 volt motors, of course, and uh, we'll draw about five amps. So this is it. After I got it fully assembled, it took me about um, an hour. What vintage of uh, 15 inch MacBook Pro are we looking at here, Brent? And there's where you went wrong. That's a 17. Oh, it's a 17. I think you've answered your own question. This is a little That's a 2011. Yeah, That's a 2011 17-inch MacBook Pro. The high-end quad-core i7 with 16 gigabytes of RAM and two internal hard disks, both of them SSDs. Where is that uh, serpentine uh, cover you for know, your cable mess here? This I kind of cable wish. management is the devil. Yeah, Can you I know, imagine I agree. threading it through all of those little spines? And then the network well, cable actually, dies, and you have to pry them out. Oh, oh. Honestly, hold, hold on, on, hold on. Hold Each on. one of those little spines has a an opening so that you can slot slot the wire into. Don't do this. Oh, what I can't is this? Doing this. What is under I this only, MacBook? I just kind of put everything. And this up is there. a just, newer MacBook too. This is it, a much newer, is a newer fifteen inch MacBook Pro. That's a that's a sixteen inch MacBook Pro. Okay, whatever. Well, you know, fifteen inch yeah. on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and is that your LG Ultra Fine display? It is not my LG UltraFine is it display. A, you, it is, is it a display port uh, or like a Thunderbolt display? Uh, no, it's actually a fairly bog standard Dell 2K 1440p really? oh, display. Oh, Dell has uh, yeah. kind of changed their monitor. I have, I, my Dell is like 10 years old at this point. Uh, anyway. Neither here nor there. Yes. Um, yeah, so there's a few more pictures in here that sort of detail the build out. And uh, this is about a maximum height there. It's this actually turned out to be rather accurate um, right out of the box. I think in one of the pictures on here is me measuring it with a yardstick. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So there you are. It actually legitimately measures the height of the desk in a digital readout. So kudos to them to get it calibrated you know, out of the box. I didn't do anything special. Just seemed to work uh, you know, just fine. Not that you care, but at least the digital readout relates to reality. This is uh, pointing out something you know, that you probably have to deal with, the fact that the bottom needs to be adjustable. And this is actually uh, one of my new places where I can go to work uh, in the house. So, yeah, with an Apple yeah. keyboard and and one of these atrocious yeah, I don't like Apple that mice much. with that little ball yeah. on top that yeah, is like I, it's it's a fight I, every day. Not not one of my favorites, although but it, it was has, just but one the of the aesthetics. Ones like, the aesthetics obviously matter to you, Brett. You've got the Apple Store style tabletop here. Yeah, all bamboo. Apple. You got a plant. Yeah. And I yeah, see the, I was, the window uh, shade kind of matches the desktop surface here. Do you like the way the light streamed in? I mean, I tried to get the streaming light, and I did yeah, this just, just for uh, you, really. Oh, I see you gave it the gold award. 
I did, and I couldn't give it the editor's choice because I this is not my first motorized desk. I've built one before, and I guess I would have to say my choice would be kind of more DIY, you know, get my own tabletop, order a motorized uh, platform for it, and kind of assemble it myself. So this really wasn't kind of my choice. And this one from FlexiSpot, a little bit on the pricey side. It runs about $500. And uh, I think for the curved edges and the couple of, of extras they throw in for the pro version, may or may not be worth it to you, but it is very, very high quality, in my opinion. Seems very nice. FlexiSpot, as a as a vendor, has a enormous catalog, and I urge people to go take a look if they're looking for something a little bit less. They've got mid twos, mid threes. You know, pick out your dollar point and you know order a setup from them. They've they've got it, but the the non pro ones have a square um, frame to them, which can be real knee killers in my opinion so i didn't mind the fact that this has the kind of rounded rounded posts on the side so that you don't really smack yourself on them gotcha yeah you know that that uh, wire thing uh, reminds me of the uh the tesla self plug-in robot cool you know, the thing. yeah don't bend over oh. yeah so you always want to face forward with that desk or otherwise oh Hey, I did forget to mention that Sebastian really had a, an important point here. I did, if you read the article, I did actually, as soon as I had it assembled, lay down on it and motored it up and down. Okay. Hey, I have an idea. Let's, Take a okay. picture of that next time and put it in the yep. review. You know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to wear my, my Joe Exotic uh, uh, outfit, no. Halloween outfit, no. and... Uh, and just oh, you, you mean know, loungewear? Your weekend loungewear that you're pretending? Yeah, and just costume? and just do the whole like, and then video the whole like you know leg up kind of thing, and yeah, just right. whoever wants to see that, just nobody the, does. But no one. It would have been nice for you to just wear normal clothes and sit on it, <laughs> and even if you don't have video, you could have at least taken like a you know the timer yeah. function on your camera and just. I could have anyway. I, you know what? I I strive to be better, and you challenge me. Well, okay. I mean, it's good to have goals, but yes. it's also good to make them achievable, and then mm. you can build mm. on that success. Okay. All right, I'm let's wearing do picks my of the week next time. But Josh, uh, I don't have a pick for oh. you. Uh, hmm. Do you have a I pick? I would totally forgot. What? You're the anchor of this segment. <laughs> Dude, well, while you think know. about it, I'm going to go to Jeremy. I'm going to skip over you entirely. Jeremy? Yeah, just pick? skip over me. Your pick? I'll get it next right. week. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it works for Sebastian, so why not? Hey, I had a pick. Yeah. I put my pick in before anybody else. You did it for you. Uh, Their Pure Rock 2 is on special at a place called Mike's Computer Shop up in Canada for what is actually a really damn nice price of 50 bucks. We did a review of this uh, not too long ago, indeed. Uh, Not even two months ago. And Kent Kent, uh, absolutely loved it. Yeah. He can't, yeah. can't love this one, yeah. Yeah, he gave it uh, a gold star for this. So, I mean, honestly, I there was significantly more than one left when I posted this, uh, by the way. <laughs> There's one I'm left in Hamilton, that. Ontario. There there was significantly more, and you're allowed to order them online, so oh, you, okay. you can still get it. But So, yeah, uh, move quickly if you want this. Otherwise, keep an eye out. Maybe he'll uh, get a little bit more stock. Uh, but, yeah, there, there was significantly more of them earlier on, and I... That's why it went so quickly, because it's it's quiet and it's it's up there almost with an Octua, and for that price, hey, you can't go wrong. Yep, this was uh, Kent's review, and as you can see, it was super quiet. It was the quietest one he's tested so far with his current test bed, by about a decibel and a half. It was thirty six point two decibels under max load, and then the thermals were. Very good for its size, especially considering how yeah. slow the fan is moving. So it was right below a Pure Rock Slim 2, uh, so 65 degrees above ambient for the average load across all cores. So that was just a little bit higher than a Dark Rock TF2 or even a Shadow Rock 3. So very good performance, very quiet, of course. I mean, that's right in the name. Yeah. It, they put it right in the name. Pretty much yeah. they put it in the name of everything that they do. Weird. All right, Brett, I am very curious about this because there are major issues with these. So I wonder if that's all been fixed. These are 
ready to go. Yeah, to be honest with you, this this and I part of the write up that I wrote on this is that it would do. This is an AV receiver from Yamaha. It's a factory refurbished. The price is right. The price is right. It's very cheap. This is the TSR seven hundred. Yep. This is normally about nine. About a, this is normally about six fifty. You can find it probably at BH, maybe Amazon, about six fifty, seven hundred dollars. This is factory refurb. All right, just get that out there. Seven at one channel, hundred watts, so not really, not super overpowered or anything. Normally, you know, seven at one, you probably want a little bit more, but depends on how loud you want to go and the size of your room and all that. But there's supposed to be a software update that eventually pushes this to capabilities of eight K switching. Right now, it's only four K switching. Just want to get that out there. Um, because that's probably what you were reacting to when you were saying whether, no, whether no, they, these have oh, a oh. horrible HDMI 2.1 bug that rendered them <clears throat> okay. essentially unusable with things like the okay. PlayStation 5. So we All right, well, just like it specifies that it's uh, compatible with Napster. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it does have a lot of uh, you know AirPlay, and I don't, I don't mean that in capital letters. It does have a lot of, of AirPlay compatibilities with different broadcast, internal, in-house broadcasts protocols and things like that so it's very aware of a lot of ability to stream audio streaming um oh here's that right up on the mm, hdmi 2.1 looks like they had an update for it last month i missed out on this because i was too busy right. uh, with tree damage but so september 2021 i think PSR two things are interesting here one one is that there's software updates for av receivers nowadays which yes, i that's just common. it's well i mean i haven't bought one since uh I don't I think I've bought one since my Denon, which was probably about 10 years ago. <clears throat> so I haven't had any recent experience. And full disclosure, uh, honestly, I just bought one of these Yamahas. I just ordered it. Oh, nice. Hmm. Well, you'll have to let us know when you hook up your PS5 if you have any issues. I'm gonna. What I'm going to do is... I'm, yeah, my PS5. What I'm going to do is I'm going to replace my Denon in the regular AV you know, room, and I'm going to take the Denon and move it to the computer and put my money where my mouth is and put a live 5.1 surround for computer gaming. Hey, if you check the new egg ad this week, they're pushing that Klipsch... Klipsch... Yeah, yeah. Klipsch... Uh, 5.1. Exactly. That's on their front page. Push 249, I think. That was my pick from last week. They're pushing it this yeah. week. Yeah, yeah. Inexpensive. Good yep. sounding. I'm going to hook it to my Denon. <laughs> I've been a Yamaha fan for years, but I was scared off by all the HDMI. I will let you know how this works those. when I get it in. Because for a while, they pulled them. You couldn't even buy them. And like, the stock was like in limbo, and they're waiting on software updates. But Sor- Soren just did a Brett Joe Exotic. Okay. He's making my, he's making it's, my head. It's right gorgeous. I, uh, we have a cover. God. Let me see. God. He's good. And he's fast. He's, yes. somebody, somebody hire this man. My pick this week is a very simple one. My son, uh, the thing he destroyed this week was the screen <laughs> on my wife's iPad. So we have uh, in the family, there are two iPads. One, my wife's old iPad Mini 2, which became my son's iPad. But it's so painfully slow after every software update because of course a software update comes down and i'm like no 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 and he's already pressed okay because a prompt came up so he presses okay every time so it's running the latest ios which of course means that it is incredibly slow because tim wants you to buy new stuff so i I was looking into it and i fix it sells these nice kits for 50 bucks where it comes with the tools you need and a new screen but hers is it has a white front they didn't have any white in stock on amazon at the time so i ordered this uh zen top which is about half the price. It's twenty five ninety nine. <clears throat> this feels off brand. Feels it like, is, but I mean, there's so many brand. brands that have so many weird <laughs> names. It's like whatever. It's twenty six dollars, and they're probably all the same. The installation kit that it came with was actually better than most, and it came with the adhesive strips pre attached, home button pre attached, all that stuff. The camera bracket was already there, and it seems to be of acceptable quality. So I would give this the acceptable quality award. For a generic... Amazon good enough. Product. Yeah, it's good enough. So my son can break it again and it only cost me $26 this time. Man, we did it. We've only been doing this podcast for about an hour now. Yep. After yeah. editing, 58 minutes. And no Tops. no sponsor tonight, so... so it's so quick. Easy. Like, it's, we did it for you guys. We did it for the, the audience. Yep. 
to. That's good because I was starting to fall asleep, even with um, <laughs> you know root beer doesn't have any caffeine, so just yeah. sugar. So wait, bar try has caffeine. You got to try real beer, Josh. That doesn't it's have any caffeine bite. either. Yeah, well, I guess this is our show. Let's we'll tune in again next week when we'll have more exciting Windows 11 revelations, uh, more rumors about upcoming GPU and CPU products, perhaps. I don't honestly even remember. Probably a different review of something. Yeah, maybe. Another review or two. Maybe. There's some stuff. You just just got something in the mail. As far as I know. Right. And that's as far as that (laughs) reference will go. Of course it is. So, yeah. Until next week. (laughs) Good night. Good night.